Hey, what's up, Australia? Uh, thanks so much for being here with us today. Um, apart from a minor incident uh, with figuring out how your ketchup packets actually work, my first trip to Australia has been amazing. So I'm really excited for this week um, uh, and learning some new things here today. So we are going to run through principles of cognition, coordination, and teaming. And I lead the research function at Jelly, and so we're going to share a little bit about some of the things that I've studied both in my dissertation research over the last five to seven years, as well as what we see working with teams uh, of SREs like yourselves. And so we'll start off kind of going through laying some of the foundations of what do we actually mean when we talk about cognition. What is coordination? Isn't it just communication? Not really. And then how do we get more effective teaming across teams that may have only just met themselves? So a lot of what we're going to talk about here today is in through the lens of incidents, because it gives us a really nice way to look at normal work under abnormal conditions. Hi, I'm Nora Jones. Um, I'm the CEO and founder of Jelly. And um, after Laura takes us through some of that, we're actually going to jump into a based on a pretty much real incident. Um, and we're going to kind of do a compare and contrast of two incidents. So I'm really excited for that section. Uh, and then we'll round it all out with Laura taking us through a collaborative learning section. So this is going to be kind of emergent because it's the interactive section. We are all about learning here at Jelly. And so we're going to try and like engage the room to be able to share sort of what we learned over the course of this talk. So quick show of hands, how many of you are into like shouty outy audience participation? <laughs> okay. And how many of you would rather type those questions or responses into the Slack channel? Okay, so we got a good mix. So we got you covered. So we're going to do both of those things. We'll let some of you shout out and we'll let some of you type into Slack and Nora or myself are going to kind of monitor those two things. So we have the Slack thread in the day one channel, so um, we'll, we'll be hanging out there. <laughs> so uh, we're going to start off with a pretty funny comic. Um, you know, I think our, our industry has kind of been through the move fast and break things. And I, I do think we've evolved a little bit. Um, but we are still moving very fast. We're moving fast in various ways. We're slowing down in various ways. And the thing is, those fast and those slow phases are not consistent. We can't always stay fast in one area and slow in other. We have to adapt and go back and forth. Um, but what we're proposing here is that we move fast and learn things. Like, yes, we still keep moving fast, but how are we learning and are we paying attention to some of the cognitive and coordinative work? So let's kick this off. So we're going to share five principles of coordination and communication um, and teaming. Um, and so these were developed drawing from decades of literature, from the safety sciences, from cognitive systems engineer, basically from studying people who do high risk, high consequence work in very ambiguous and uncertain kinds of environments where the world is always changing. So Y'all might not be like fighter pilots or astronauts, but there you share a lot of the same cognitive characteristics around how you interpret the world, what kinds of signals you receive from the world about what's happening, and then how do you actually reason about that to make sense of what actions and decisions are available to me, and how do I bring in the needed resources uh, to help me carry out my goals and priorities. So as I mentioned, we're going, to talk, we're going to talk about this through the lens of incidents. So the first principle that we have here is talking about cognitive work being more than applying technical knowledge. So this isn't just about you being really, really good at understanding specific aspects of your systems. It's also about being able to apply that in a very flexible and dynamic way. And a lot of this work, a lot of this effort to be able to notice what's happening in the world around you, to make sense of that, and then to be able to recruit and, uh, and bring those resources, needed resources to bear in real time is skill. And it takes effort. And a lot of this effort is actually hidden. We don't really see it in, or talk about it in the day-to-day -day work activities. So the cognitive work, when, to kind of like make a bit of a finer point on this, is the ways in which people, you, interact with information in your job. 
What kinds of data do you get about how the system is performing? What do you do with that data? Who do you ask for more information? Where do you go look? How do you pull all of these things together to figure out what can you still, or what activities can you still carry out? And then where are you just trying to stop the system from collapsing in, in entirety? So this is actually what we call the thinking parts of your work. So this is technical kind of work on a bit of a different scale. Rather than thinking about, about the systems that we operate on, we're thinking about the technical aspects of how people conduct their work and carry out their work on these systems. So the American playwright David Foster Wallace kind of sums this up in a really nice way. He tells this allegory about these two fish that are swimming around in a fishbowl. And one morning they're out for a little swim and there's an older fish coming towards them, kind of nods and says, morning boys, the water's fine. And the fish swim on. And then a couple seconds later, one turns to the other and says, what the heck is water? And this is actually a really nice, succinct way of talking about cognitive work in site reliability engineering. Because it's the water that we swim in and we don't often talk about it, we don't have language, and we don't often identify the characteristics of this cognitive work that make things difficult or make things much easier when you're working collaboratively across uh, both internal teams and more broadly across external teams. So one of, the, one of the laws that's at play here is this law of fluency. The reason why we don't see this and we don't talk about it is because experts actually do this remarkably well. The expertise that's inherent in, uh, in like very proficient practice is very hidden. That effort is hidden. And so another way of saying this is like when you're really good, you make it look really easy. It's kind of like our friend that's chopping the onion here. We, uh, we almost, he's doing it so well that we almost don't notice that with an errant slip of the knife, he could take his whole hand off. We almost don't notice that that pile that is underneath him could be quite a bit smaller. We don't notice that the uniformity of the onions that he's chopping. So all of the expertise, the proficiency that he has at play here it's very smooth and it's very, uh, it's, quite, it's quite hidden. You know, it's interesting, Laura, just to even add on to it, like the person that is chopping these onions too, probably wouldn't even be able to explain to you how he could do it like this. You know, if you're coming in as a novice, he has had years of practice doing all this stuff. And that's what happens to us as engineers at our organization as well. You know, we get so good at it that we don't quite recognize our expertise and we don't quite recognize how we're making it look easy. Yeah, 100%. When you do knowledge elicitation with uh, practitioners and you ask them, how do you do the thing that you do? They're often terrible at explaining it to them because all of that effort has kind of sunk into the background and it becomes less visible, less accessible to them. So this is often what I see when I study software engineers like yourself, site reliability engineers who are tasked with maintaining and keeping these systems upright and running despite the fact that it may be full of explodey bits that have a lot of hidden dependencies and you know, can take the system down at a moment's notice, um, or things like your proficiency at keeping an on-call schedule that might be staffed almost entirely with junior engineers from becoming a problem because of how seamlessly you're able to move in and out of incidents or to prevent and anticipate problems uh, that, that enable that smooth performance. So the second principle that we're gonna talk about is how SRE work requires these finely tuned skills in being able to de detect, to notice what's happening in the world around you, to then diagnose and reason about what that actually means, and then to be able to very flexibly apply your knowledge and your expertise um, to a novel or unstructured problem. So in the detection kind of phase, we often think, well, you know, we have monitoring everywhere. This is what observability is for. But oftentimes, the reason that that, that monitoring is in place is because there was a case, there was an incident at some point in time in which someone didn't notice the system was degrading or performance was degrading, or because they, you, had to, you had difficulties in kind of understanding what was happening in the system, and so you needed more insight into what was going on there. Um, and the diagnostic aspects of this work 
has to do with your ability to kind of take those signals, some of which may be intermittent, which may be ambiguous, they may be uh, unclear or uh, of poor quality, and to be able to make sense of that and say, given that I have this kind of information, how do I move forward? How do I tell my team and help my team to move forward with that? And then, of course, being able to apply that to these novel and unstructured problems is really what differentiates kind of high-performing teams from teams that we see that struggle with a lot of complexity and uncertainty in their work. And the reason for that is the more uh, novice practitioners uh, face uh, difficult problems, the more closely that problem has to represent the knowledge that they have and how that actually went into their memory and into their, their, uh, uh, their schema about how the world works. Whereas experts who have a bit more capabilities to be able to take signals reason about how they might apply to various different scenarios and be able to address more unstructured or novel um, situations. So this is what finely tuned skills look like in practice. This is a series of transcripts and video recordings and Slack transcripts of SREs like yourselves who are doing their normal everyday work. It looks kind of boring because it's just people talking about what is going on uh, within the system, what do they know, what do they not know, what's difficult or uncertain. But the key point here is that by taking a closer look at these interactions and seeing who is able to flexibly apply that knowledge, who has like superpowers in being able to detect even subtle variations of system performance and then reason about this is going to be problematic and we need to get the team on it now. These early kind of detections and these abilities to collaborate and communicate effectively are what sets a lot of uh, teams apart. And also telling the stories behind them. You know, with the detection and the um, diagnosis phases you were talking about before and the observability that kind of falls out of some of these things, like there is a story behind all of that. And then the stories that we tell are how we unveil our expertise too and how we lift others up. Yeah, yeah, not only unveil that, but make it accessible to mm -hmm. other people as well. So this cognitive work that we're talking about, it's about the ability to anticipate, to observe, to recognize, to troubleshoot, to modify, to revise in real time. Because the world is always changing and it's moving quickly and we don't always, we have often partial and incomplete information about what's happening. So the second side of that coin of the cognitive work and the sort of the, the uh, difficulties or effort that's required in SRE is the collaboration and the coordination side of things. Anytime you're working in a large scale distributed system, this is not news to any of you, you have to do it with other people. No one individual has all the knowledge, skills or capability or is up 24 hours a day to be able to keep that system working. So it's necessary and it actually adds a whole other series of effort and a bunch of work that often gets under, uh, underexplored and underexamined. So this kind of work is stuff like recruiting. Who can help me right now? What information, knowledge, skills, access do they have that I can use to help with the problem that I'm facing? What kind of information do I give them to make them not overload them with everything that's going on, but make them useful as quickly as possible? How do I recognize when we're starting to, to come off the same page about what's happening in the incident and we need to stop and reground and update each other about here's what I think is going on and here's what I think the next course of action should be. It's about taking initiative and delegating tasks in a very smooth and seamless way to keep things working under time pressure and uncertainty and stress. And so when we think about this in uh, software engineering teams and in site reliability teams, we can start to see how the amount of variability of skills, of knowledge, of experience that exists within every single team is both a feature and a bug. Because on one hand, having that diversity means you have a much broader collection of skills and capabilities to draw from, and it means there's gonna be limitations in your ability to handle certain kinds of incidents. So therefore, the ability to coordinate more effectively and to make use of those multiple diverse perspectives becomes a skill in and of itself. 
I'm curious, like, how many of you have had your team change, whether you changed companies, whether more people came on your team or left your team in this past year? How many, yeah. t how many of it has happened at least three times? Yeah, your team is changing all the time, which means your mental model of your team needs to change all the time as well. Absolutely, and so this skill set, this, this expertise at being able to coordinate in real time and to learn about what other people know and don't know and how do you make the best use of that becomes incredibly important. And so uh, David Woods, who's a resilience engineering researcher, talks about how as your system gets more and more complex, the accuracy of anyone who is working on that system of their mental model actually decreases. So it drives the need for coordination across a broader group of skill sets. So we need these multiple diverse perspectives to be able to not only be uh, brought into incidents or brought into uh, decisions in real time, but we need them to be able to come up to speed very quickly, and we need them to have a good sense of what do other people in this incident know? What do they know about the system, and what do they know about what's happening right now, and about what the possible courses of action are for moving forward? So this is all about common ground. It's all about how do we establish a basis for working very, very effectively together in what is often ad hoc and unstructured teams. Uh, the amount of hands that went up right uh, just a moment ago to say I've switched teams or I have be I've had to come into a new team and to really learn and understand what is it that my team actually knows? What do they not know? Who do we rely on? Where our dependencies exist? Who relies on us? What are the goals and priorities and constraints of the organization, which inevitably either increase the possibility for action or decrease the possibility for action? Knowing this kind of grounding information about how the system works and what's important to it helps you to reason about the problems that you're facing and to select the, the most uh, useful course of action given the system that, or the, the scenario that you're facing. So this brings us to another really key point is that all parties who are engaged in joint activity, they have different goals and priorities. So the CEO or the senior leadership of the organization has a broader view of say the market, uh, potentially of funders, they are thinking about the goals and priorities of uh, some of the users or some of the competitors, whereas the customer support person might be thinking more locally in terms of the user that's on the other end of the phone uh, with them or on a problem that they're seeing repeatedly come up. And so they're going to advocate for and, and view the problem through a very specific lens. So navigating these different goals and priorities is a part of that cognitive and coordinative effort. It's also because in these kinds of scenarios, there can be so much awkward. And in this kind of work, this shows up in ways like people unwilling to say, I don't actually understand what you're talking about, or I, my understanding of how the system works in this way is limited, or it's partial, or it's incomplete. It's basically saying, I don't know. Nobody wants to do that. It's awkward, it's uncomfortable. But we also have a hard time pointing out when we're listening to somebody talk about something and that understanding is partial and incomplete and saying, hey, I think we need to actually update our understanding of the system. So navigating these kinds of social difficulties can also be quite challenging. So these teams, it's not only then about the, the, the skills to detect, diagnose, and apply the technical aspects of your knowledge, but it's also about the ability to then anticipate and adjust to signal and delegate and take initiative when you are working collaboratively across a broader group of folks. And so this shows up in a lot of ways in those very simple uh, cases when you start to look closely at what happens during an incident. And Nora's going to show this in the incident that she, uh, that she co covers with you all about how these seemingly innocuous aspects of normal everyday work actually reveal a lot about how the system works and how it doesn't work very effectively. 
And so this helps us get much more specific and much more prescriptive about the kinds of things that you can do to adjust, to, to create corrective actions that actually help the team have more resilient performance, be more adaptive over a variety of situations. So this last point, the last principle of cognition and coordination and teaming is that resilient organizations are networks that share capacities and they adapt according to the, command, or to the demands. So their ability to reconfigure in real time to relax or strengthen certain kinds of constraints or prioritize other people's goals ahead of their own um, is what enables the team to, to handle a broader range of events under a broader uh, collection of um, conditions. And so this is being able to, to join an incident that you may not be on call for. Uh, this is about a team that typically uh, you know, doesn't handle support tickets for others, opening up and saying, yeah, we'll, ju we'll jump in on this and help you out with it. And it's that reciprocating when opportunities arise to work more effectively together. So what's the key point of talking about this sort of foundational knowledge of cognitive and coordinative work? Well, it's that you actually cannot meaningfully improve the reliability and the resilience of these systems without looking at the cognitive work. And a spoiler alert, this is itself work. I know as engineers, we kind of want to automate everything, including understanding our incidents but we're actually hurting ourselves by automating that too much, you know, because part of the value of this is learning, you know, putting things in our brain, reading things, learning things, not having a machine do it for us and understanding this cognitive work is, is work. Um, and so, like Laura said, I'm gonna take you through a couple incidents today. Um, spoiler alert, they are the exact same incident. Um, so this incident actually really helped me underscore the value of studying cognitive work through the lens of incidents. And it shows just how much data we end up leaving on the table after an incident, after an investment that already got made. Um, I came to do this comparison study actually because in another life, in another job, I was tasked with doing an incident review on an incident that had already had a review done for it. Um, and it informed how I think about, a lot about the work that Laura mentioned and using incidents as a lens to recognize and surface and share and disseminate some of this work with my coworkers. Um, so the first investigation I'm gonna take you through is the first incident review for this. Um, and then all of the findings that came out of it, you'll actually see all of it on screen. And then the second investigation is of the same incident but with fresh eyes, a different perspective and a new and different review. Um, this is based off of true events, but I have fictionalized everything in here, so anything that is based on anything you see is totally uh, coincidental. Uh, <laughs> so, investigation one. A seemingly innocuous incident that didn't have much customer impact. Uh, it didn't deserve or have time for a thorough postmortem because it was, it was really quick and no one really noticed, so let's just move on. Does this sound familiar to anybody? Has this happened to anybody this past week? Have you had an event that you, that where you were like, okay, that was almost bad, but we have other things to do. <laughs> um, so this first investigation had a templated approach. Uh, it was completed by the members of the team most involved in the incident. So they did do an incident review, you know? Um, the purpose was to file and report, you know, to eventually be like, Let's, let's report this so that we can maybe reference it back at, and, you know, in case it ever happens again or let's prevent this from ever happening again. So the template looked like this. You know, we had a summary, we had an impact, detection, resolution. We had a more detailed summary. Um, we listed some contributing factors, uh, had a quick timeline, what went well, what went wrong, how we got lucky, and action items. Does this look familiar to everybody? Yeah. Yeah, it's a pretty familiar timeline, right? But it limits us, you know? Um, we don't know a lot of things, right? We don't know how much time was spent on this document. We don't know who read it. We don't know who attended the meeting. We don't know who this was for. Who are you writing your incident review for? Is it for yourself? Is it for your team? Is it for people outside of your team? What do you want them to get out of it? Are you asking for feedback on it? And what was difficult or easy about handling the incident, which 
draws back to Laura's principles earlier. We're not understanding that fully. So this is the summary of incident number one. Um, a change was made to some of the search infrastructure tooling that updates which search index to look at each day. We were able to recreate the issues, and soon after it had been reported, engineering was able to tr track down the problem and fix the bad configuration. Due to the nature of the bug, no pre-processing work had to be done for search to be functional again. Uh, more detailed summary, right? So that was the TLDR. The search index is split into collections, a large collection for older SKUs. So this is an e-commerce company. Um, SKUs are stock keeping units, and they're using them to represent a particular product that is in the e-commerce search. And two to three collections for recent SKUs, one per day for newly created SKUs. Each collection had to be individually submitted for reading or writing, and since search queries typically read from our coll all collections from a given vendor. We employ a feature called Collection Read Alias, which allows us to read from many collections using one name, and new daily collections are created, typically done two days in advance, and they are added to the read alias. So we had a bug in our tooling that intro was introduced a week before, and newly created daily collections were not being added to the read alias. Uh, since collections were created and added to the alias two days in advance, the first collection to be affected by the bug was three days ago. Uh, and then this is what the timeline looked like. So um, we had a bug introduced on December 4th. Uh, the December 6th collection was created and not added to the alias. The newly created messages started going into the December 6th alias. Uh, and then, you know, a couple days later, we start an incident channel based on customer reports. Um, we see an issue with elevated error rates as a red herring. We have a potential cause that cause is rolled out a couple minutes later. Um, the cause is actually identified as a misconfiguration in the read alias. The configuration is fixed. The fix is confirmed. The fix is applied to the index file. It looks pretty fast, right? You know, it, it maybe you know maybe this didn't deserve this this whole like thorough didn't deserve a more thorough postmortem, right? Um, but if I'm reading this as an engineer, there, there aren't things in here that are telling me how to do my job better. It's just kind of documenting high-level stuff of what happened. What, what's the point of this? Like, yes, it's telling me some things, but I have a lot of questions. You know, what, what is that bug on December 4th? Why was it introduced? How was it introduced? How did it make sense? Um, I have questions about some of the red herrings and some of the rabbit holes that went down. I have questions about how people responded to this so quickly. Um, and then, you know, we'll, they had an impact section. Um, all e-commerce users had a degraded search experience for 20 minutes over the w which the incident took place. Contributing factors were lack of a type system or static analysis and code, and alert that would have detected this is also broken. Lack of and that would have, you know, are kind of are kind of hard here. You know, we're seeing some normative language. We're seeing some counterfactuals. I don't know if I'm a new engineer coming into this organization reading this. I don't really know what this means. Also, I think you could put this as a contributing factor on almost any incident that you have. Maybe um, what went well? Fairly quick fix. I don't know what fairly quick means. In what terms? What is quick in this organization? How am I supposed to know to ask? The, like, which questions to ask or what we consider fairly quick and why, what is the customer experience. Um, what went wrong? Alert that should have caught the misconfiguration was also broken. If it should have, it would have, right? So how did it not? It's not, again, not telling me much here. And how we got lucky. I have lots of gripes with how we got lucky sections, but I will, I will save those for another type's time. It happened during a low traffic time and not many users were impacted. Again, norms. What is low traffic in this organization? Is this a predictable low traffic time? Do we always have low traffic on this particular day, on this particular time? What does this actually mean? And what does not many users here were impacted mean? Action items. Fix the bug that prevented the read alias from being updated. Fix the alert that should have fired. Check all of our alerts to make sure they fire. <laughs> what, what did you learn from incident number one? If you were a new engineer coming into this organization, what did you learn? So this is where we're actually going to use a thread. The what did you learn was um, rhetorical. I am curious what questions you have 
about incident number one. And so I'll give you some time to either put them in the thread or as Laura mentioned, shout out people, them out. this is your time. What questions do you have? I have lots <laughs> and I know you do too. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. What learn? It was almost like they didn't take them on the journey with them. Like, sorry. I'm, um, can you just? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Sorry. If you can just repeat so that the recordings there, can. Yeah. Um, so the yeah. the question was, it wasn't really documented which learnings came out of this incident, and I have no doubt that the author of this document learned some things, right? But they weren't taking others on the journey with them, and so all that learning was kind of staying within them. And also, the author of this document was on the search team and was <laughs> deeply in the incident. So I'm curious, like, you know, if, if that had much ROI too. That was a great question. I think it's a really good point as well because it helps to show the diversity of those mental models, right? Mm -hmm. Who knew? Why did they know that? What kinds of experiences had they had? And then that helps to expand that learning to other folks as well. Totally. We have a couple of comments here in Slack. Um, how are we preventing or mitigating this sort of bug reoccurring? Should I distrust alerting in the future? How did mm -hmm. the SREs know what to look for and where? How mm -hmm. many customers were in fact, uh, affected? How does the team suggest to make sure all alerts work? And what led the engineer to point to a lack of system or static analysis as a contributing factor? And Swaller, has this happened before? These are, these are great, great questions. questions. All, all questions I had as well. So this brings me to in investigation number two for this same incident. It's always a little bit more complex than it appears. Um, conducted by an engineer outside of the main team, so still someone technical that could ask the technical questions, but didn't quite sit in it. You know, This gives a pr fresh perspective. It allows us to ask these questions that everyone's asking right now, which are actually really useful to document and enroll others in and write down. Uh, it included evidence from previous deploys, some well before the event. Uh, it included teams impacted but not previously involved in the timeline. I mean, this timeline really just involves search. We actually don't really know who it involves because there were no names mentioned. There were no teams mentioned. I have no idea who is involved in this particular incident. Uh, and it informed new team members about system dynamics in terms of both the humans coordinating and um, and the, uh, the system dynamics on, um, in the technical system. And the purpose was to engage the audience and to be read and to be enrolled in the process. So um, this is loosely uh, what informed some of the Howie guide that we actually published on the Jelly website. It's totally free. We don't even take email captures, so just go grab it and uh, you can see some of the guide and template. Um, but we talk about the background of the document, we talk about who responded, who investigated, the executive summary. Not only do we talk about customer impact, but we talk about employee impact. And this is really actually important to talk about because, you know, especially with like the market conditions going on right now, our human systems are changing quite a lot. And, you know, it's really, it's actually more important than ever to support your best employees and to also build people up. And so if you're documenting how people are being impacted by these things, you're gonna get ahead of this and actually be investing in them and creating a learning environment for them, which helps people enjoy their jobs, right? Um, talk about some key takeaways, talk about what triggered the event, contributed, mitigated. This is too much to put in this entire uh, presentation, but we will put some of it in here. So. I wanna go back to the first incident timeline just to remind you, and I want to point to these first four sections. We have a bug introduced in the Python tooling. We have a collection created and not added to the alias. Um, we have newly created um, events starting to go into the new alias, and then the incident channel starts based on customer reports. The search team is paged and begins work. So this is what it actually looked like when we can look into it. And this is the importance of honestly using some raw data in our incident reviews. So um, I actually, you know, our event started on December 4th in theory, but when we look into it, it actually kind of started on November 23rd and it probably started back earlier than that. So Justin Bacon is our um, fictional search engineer. Uh, and he says, we're, re we're receiving requests right now related to the key change beta release. 
And so between November 23rd and November 30th, um, so they, change, they do a key change and then they start getting alerted for all these invalid keys afterwards. They are getting inundated with alerts all the time. And there are all these false alerts, like they're like, oh, we knew, th we, knew we did this key change. And so you know, we're getting all these alerts all the time. And so they're starting to get burnt out by these alerts. Um, it's creating a source of fatigue and confusion. So on December, 20, on December 3rd, they introduce, a, um, they introduce a PR to avoid these noisy alerts uh, and to ignore um, don't alert when the key is invalid. We can probably see where, where this is going, right? Um, a partition gets created on, um, to hold indices for the December 6th, and these are auto, also automatically created two days in advance. Uh, and then a separate um, unrelated PR is introduced not to update the read aliases for live collections during a migration. This, actu this PR actually had nothing to do with this. An engineer that was working on this was just bothered that the migration times were taking a minute longer. And so they added this single cleanup line to this particular PR that had nothing to do with this. Um, and then, so we can see how these two PRs kind of relate now. And then between December 4th and December 6th, Errors are detected, but there is no pages due to PR 22. So this is where search queries begin not reaching the December 6th partition. Um, all right, and then I want to take you to a completely separate channel. Uh, so Connor Jacobs is a fictional customer service person. Uh, he happens to be up uh, working on automation that should stop bots from trying to go to their e-commerce website. and scrape things. Um, so he's just posting what he's doing. Um, and so as a part of this organization, every time um, someone deploys anything, they need to go through this whole series of tests for the website. And a lot of what I learned even looking into this was that um, these tests are pretty high level and it was by design, right? They were like, okay, do add to cart. Um, but they don't provide instructions on how you're supposed to do add to cart. And that was by design. They were like, well, you know, if everyone does it a little bit differently, we'll get <laughs> a lot of different results. And so we might catch more things was, was some of the rationale. Uh, and then, you know, they were doing a search test. And none of what they were doing with these um, spam bots actually touched search or add to cart or any core website functionality. And, you know, Connor notices, hmm, you know, Search is not returning a SKU I just added in test. I'm assuming that's normal behavior. My deployment wasn't related to search. So he keeps going to a second deploy that he's gonna make and search stops working again. So now he's like, that's a little weird. Um, so again, we'll go to incident timeline number one. Um, so we're still not quite at item four yet when the incident channel starts based on customer reports. So we're missing all this background info. We're missing all these people already involved that are not in the search team. Uh, and then we'll jump into the customer experience channel. So the incident actually hasn't started yet. So Natalie from the customer experience team is receiving reports that customers can't access search results for items in a promo email they sent out the other day. So now marketing is involved too, now customer experience is involved, and Natalie's looking into it and managing them, and Connor happens to jump in and is like, uh, you know what, I actually think I just saw this related to this scraping thing I was trying to do to, to stop other people. Uh, and he's able to recognize that really fast because he was doing that other work. None of this was mentioned before, right? Um, I'm going to page the search team. Connor's on customer experience. How, how did Connor know how to page the search team is also a question I have. Oh, he can't figure out auto-paging. He's going to manually page them, which I think pages all of them. So this kind of makes sense how they solved it all so quickly because they all jumped in the channel immediately, right? They all jump in the channel, which is great. Go search team, right? Like they're all on top of it. This is also the middle of the night for all of them. This search team is on a completely different part of the world. None of this is documented either, right? Um, and they, they end up getting like celebrated a lot in the organization. Like, wow, search is so awesome. They're such a great team. But like, this is not, you know, quite sustainable. Um, so you can see Justin jump in, Natalie jump in, Jen jump in, and um, you know Justin's like, I don't see any messages past UTC midnight in the search results. Nat says, yeah, 12.05 and later is not in the read alias. I'm gonna update it. Melissa joins. I'm here too. They all stick around, you know. Um, they're curious, uh, disaster tourism a little bit. Uh, and so Justin realizes very quickly that it is related to PR23, a variable named update alias 
This is overrode the method named update aliases, ga python. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, like, and I included this, you know, actual UG Python in the report as well because there is a lot of nuance in there, right? And as if we remember PR23, it wasn't even related to this update aliases overriding method. You know, it was related to something else. They were doing this work to improve the migration. Um, um, my colleague is reminding me that I'm <laughs> <laughs> pressed for time. Uh, so we have some follow-up items that came out of this event. You know, evangelization on different definition of what is considered critical for search to be working. Deploys were happening for several days um, before this. And so all these people that were running deploys were testing search and no one noticed that this was happening because everyone tests search a little bit differently. Right, um, creating an explicit on-call rotation for human-driven pages, segmenting multiple changes into separate PR cleanup work. I didn't see any of these action items in the first one. And then um, multiple notions of what it means for search to be working, incident handling excellence is influenced by team cohesiveness and collaboration. Changing code with alerts has risk. Um, ease of coordination due to familiarity of team, quick awareness of issue at hand. There's so much more we can even dig into with this, but you know, we, we have a bit of differences with this. Like, so yes, it took a little bit longer to investigate this incident. I think there was 45 minutes spent on the first investigation. There was one week spent on the second. Um, time of incident appears to only be 20 minutes for incident one. It date ba dates back to three weeks for incident two. There's two contributing factors for the first incident. There's eight for the next. There's two action items that got completed, even though three got created. There were six from the first one. There were two people involved in the first incident. There were actually eight in the second. Um, no difficulties during handling. That was never mentioned because all the search team was online and they're so good at this, so there were no difficulties, right? Like, why would we document that? Um, impact, customer, impact, customer, and employee. Readers of this document, 10. Readers, 140. That's a big difference, right? It might be worth that week of work that we spent on this. So why does the focus on cognition and coordination and teaming matter to your organization? Investigation reports can give the writer of the document more ex expertise themselves. Uh, they can become training documents. They can inform chaos experiments. They can serve as professional development and refresher training. They can be living documents. They can help enable meta-analysis across incidents. You know, if you're I know you're doing analysis across all, all your incidents, but if you're putting garbage in, you're gonna get garbage out across that as well. Um, highlighting goal conflicts and changing organizational priorities. My, my friend Tim, big fan of highlighting goal conflicts. Uh, and identifying where headcount is needed or not needed. Informing build versus buy decisions as well. Um, this can be key on that. Uh, quick tips, don't use only customer impact to warrant a review. Get an outside technical investigator that is not on the main team or involved in the incident and make it engaging. Make it something that you would want to read. I think just to jump back to um, a couple of slides before, one of the things that's really important, I think, about the, this aspect of like the multifaceted ways in which incident reports can be used within the organization, that kind of speaks to people's different goals and priorities as well, right? Uh, the customer support team might use that as a way of leveling up their uh, customers or the support agent's ability to know who is key and important on different teams. Mm -hmm. What we see in a lot of the normal work of incident response and incident handling is a person who recently switched teams but is still being DM'd to, to being pulled into incidents because they left that team with all their knowledge and their expertise. It didn't necessarily get transferred effectively. Um, and so they are still sort of filling the gaps for that team. But that isn't getting recorded. The yeah. fact that that is happening is not getting documented anywhere. It's just, it's just known. Yeah, we'll, de we'll deal with that later. Or maybe we won't deal with that because this person is just so good at that, right? Yeah, so it becomes this perpetuating problem uh, right. instead of actually getting uh, dealt with. So these reports have the, the ability to serve multiple purposes across multiple different levels within the organization. All right, so we talked about this being an interactive session. Um, so our learning is our jam. It is 100% of what we do. It's a lot of what we think about in how we interact as a team together. 
Um, and we think quite strategically about different ways to increase and enhance learning in the kinds of conversations that we had. There was a question that came up in the Slack saying, hey, this actually sounds like a lot of these capabilities, these ability to conduct really high level sophisticated cognitive work, the ability to smoothly coordinate across teams, and the ability to sort of rapidly form you know, ad hoc teams that have shared goals and priorities, that sounds pretty sophisticated. But in truth, a lot of this can be embedded into your everyday practices and in subtle changes to how you ask questions, how you talk about the work, and, and bringing up language and, and aspects of the work that we don't typically tend to include in the conversation. So that's what we want to do with part three of this uh, discussion here. And a gentleman in the corner sort of talked a little bit about like the multiple diverse perspectives and like what did everybody learn that was different from, uh, from their peers. So when we think about what, what does learning actually mean, it can mean a number of different things depending on where you're at, your level of expertise and your sort of skills and proficiency. So the sort of base level is your ability to recall facts. I thought it was interesting that there's a concept called common ground and that this helps people have shared sort of beliefs and assumptions about uh, how the system works. It can be a level up from that where you're able to sort of compare and contrast some of what you heard or some of what you learned in uh, incident reviews or learning reviews by saying, hey, the way that, that the team carried out this task is different than what we saw in the past. And here's what I think that means for how quickly this incident got resolved or how much difficulty we had in being able to detect and understand what was really going on. Uh, some other forms are being able to sort of define or to enhance your definition of what, some, what you thought something meant. So I didn't realize that part of reasoning about problems had to do with constantly updating with new information or being able to communicate that to others. So these are just kind of examples of some of the sorts of things that we are curious about what you heard uh, in the presentation today and what you think that means for your own uh, work when you go back uh, at the end of this conference. So here's the uh, interaction participatory session. Shouty outies, go right ahead. And for those of you who are in Slack, um, you can drop your questions or your comments about what you learned uh, in the, the chat. Yeah, kick it off. Um, I've, got a mic. I've got a mic, so I'll use it. Okay. Um, a lot of this feels to me like you need to establish culture in your organization that makes it acceptable to do things like violate hierarchies. So even though there's a director in the room you, and you're a newbie, you're the person going, but don't we have blah or whatever. So. I guess my, one of my questions is, how do you establish a useful set of culture? And obviously, some of the learning you want to take away from incidents is also about how you mutate culture. And the other observation I was going to make was, uh, some of what you need to establish is not just that people know something, that everyone knows that they know it as well, right? It's as much about um, uh, knowing that someone is an expert on search, mm. yes. and everyone knows they're the expert on search, yes. as it is that someone is an expert on search. So I, I just sort of wanted to comment on how do you build the culture and how do you, um, and how do you, to, how do you take your learnings and then use that to mutate culture to the advantage of the you know, future incidents? Yeah, so I think the, the, the learning that you shared there in terms of like uh, this being, like just the knowledge, that sort of common ground, that circle that we talked about, the knowledge of who knows what and how to get a hold of them is very important. And we see that recruiting piece, it doesn't typically follow, it, it's not the pager duty schedule or it's not like the person who is supposed to be on call. It is a, you know, often a back channel or a DM or someone had lunch with somebody else a few weeks ago and found out that they know things mm -hmm. that are gonna be useful and relevant. So I think that's a really important point to bring up. Um, in terms of the culture piece, Nora loves the organizational change management aspect, <laughs> so I'm gonna let her take the first uh, kick at that. I mean, you know, favorite, favorite answer, it depends on your culture, right? Um, it's a, and you know, don't use a one size fits all for some of these change management things, but do it slowly. I, you know, I, at the couple organizations I was at before Jelly that, 
you know, if, if I was at an organization that didn't fully support it, I just kind of did it underground a little bit. You know, um, I had like I would I would investigate these seemingly innocuous incidents. Um, I would you know just kind of improve a little bit above the status quo, and then a little bit above that, and then a little bit above that. Right, like just kind of take folks on a journey. Write down you know what folks are getting out of it. I I also sought a lot of feedback too. You know, uh, if you're running a new type of incident review, or if you've done your incident investigation a little bit differently, ask people to read it and ask people to say, hey, I'm trying something new. Can you tell me if you learned something from this document? And just ask them what they learned. And you're gonna get a bunch of different answers. And that's some of the ROI too. And then documenting what people learned, you know, documenting like where things are being found out like that. But I think it's like a continuous cycle of enrolling all of your colleagues in this too and not doing all the work just as a single unit. Something I would add to that organizational change management piece is many organizations, most organizations, have this propensity to lean into a one and done. Let's create the program to end all programs and this change is gonna sustain and it's, all, it, you know, it's gonna fit all use cases and all teams within the organization and that almost never works. And it sucks up a lot of resources and it drains a lot of energy and burns out a lot of your advocates who you know, are investing in helping you make that change and seeing them not necessarily work. So taking a stance of ex being experimental uh, starting with small scale pilot projects, you know, talking about these things not as if they are complete and they are you know, fully fleshed out, but rather these are the approaches that we're trying, yeah. making it be a little bit unfinished so that uh, people can see how they can participate in helping sustain that change and move it forward. And it will never be finished. Yeah. You know, you will constantly be evolving your organization. My, our challenge to you is like, if you feel more representative of incident one in your organizations to try to take some steps to move towards incident two, because you'll get some value out of it. There are a lot of great questions in the chat. I do, I want to read Kenneth's, um, I just lost it. Uh, do we got any other shouty outies oh. while we're looking for Kenneth? Oh, how, yeah. how do we avoid silos and expert knowledge by exposing issues to less experienced people? This is when it's so important to have someone that wasn't involved in the incident running the incident review, but still technical, ideally an engineer on another team that can ask this expert these questions. Because as we saw with the onion chopper earlier, they're probably not going to be able to explain it to you very well, or it's going to be kind of obvious to them. And so I, that's a big part of that, is exposing what you know, so-and-so knows, getting them to show you what they pulled up on their computer when they were at this mm -hmm. incident. Like, oh, I went to this graph, why? Why did you go to this graph? You know, how did you know to go to this graph? Have you gone to this graph before? Did you create this graph? Does, do other people know about this graph? Like, what other situations do you use this graph for? That expert is not going to write all that down if they're doing the incident review themselves. Um, it's so important to get these outside perspectives because that's how you grow these experts and avoid these knowledge silos. I think another piece that I would add to that, which kind of talks about the culture aspect as well, is normalizing the ability to say, I don't know how mm -hmm. this works, or I don't understand this. Yeah. Um, particularly modeling that with many of your senior staff engineers, principal engineers, that is really impactful because it enables junior engineers or people new to a team to start identifying when they have knowledge gaps and then for the team to be able to collectively say, hey, someone else over in this department knows more about that. How do we bring that knowledge in and start creating that network where we can start to break down the silos? And not just making it okay for that to happen, celebrating it, because it's, it's just better for everyone. Our systems and our people, as we all pointed out earlier by our hand raises, are changing all the time. And so even if you are a very tenured SRE and joining a new company, guess what, you're a novice again, right? You're a novice in this new system. And so think about like when you are a tenured SRE, how that is going to be happening everywhere through your system. You want to build up more expertise. It, it helps you, it helps your system run more efficiently. You might not be over hiring where you don't need to. It can help you understand where your gaps actually are. So we're about to get the two minute signal here. What other kind of juicy learnings or questions do we have? Yes. Uh, 
Yeah, so the question was, how do you te keep team members who may be distributed across the world in the loop about the learnings and what's happening? And it's a really good question because oftentimes, you know, teams will have like a single meeting, you know, to do a learning review or to talk about, you know, what just happened. Another thing that I noticed during uh, my dissertation research where I looked at teams from across a number of different organizations is that after the incident was over, you know, the, the piles of rubbish were, were smoking and people closed the lids of their laptop, there was like an informal debrief that either took place right behind the desks or in the kitchen or in the hallways. And a lot of this sense making that went on was so valuable and was really uh, poignant and didn't get captured, it was ephemeral. And so if you are like having postmortem meetings as being the only kind of artifact that you produce, you're gonna be losing some of that learning. So you need to provide some traceability. Um, what we're seeing teams do increasingly is not necessarily invest in the heavy um, you know, write-ups per se, but rather doing lightweight documents that get shared and distributed. And so they become more of that living document that Nora was talking about where it's a chance to calibrate and recalibrate. What do we learn about this? What do we know? What do we not know? Who knows th the answers to these questions? And enrolling people in is a big thing. That's, you know, look, look at who is participating in your document. Look at who is correcting you um, on the, that, that is important. Like you're not gonna, when you offload your incident review doc to the masses, you want to get some things wrong. Not intentionally, but like you will get things wrong and people should read enough to correct it or, or add in more information. And just to kind of put a point on this, everyone is sharing they've learned different things throughout our talk. That's what's going to happen with your incident reviews too, right? And so share them with each other, share what folks are learning. Um, that is our time. We are we do have a booth out in the uh, foyer, and we'd love to have you stop by and tell us a little bit more about what you learned. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.